Um, the topic's going to be, um, of this breakout session, is going to be Innovating the Globe, the Impact of Technology in a Connected World. And yeah, I will be your moderator. So um, if the topic sounds interesting to you and um, you think you're in the right place, I hope you made a wise decision because you will be stuck with me for the next hour. <laughs> All right. Um, speaking about myself, um, I'm a student of the Diplomatic Academy here. Um, I am an eight-year program student, so Environmental Technology and International Affairs, um, which is more the environmental side of, of studies. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to moderate this panel because my background is in um, computer science, actually. So it's a very um, engineering, um, it's a study in, in, in the engineering field. So um, some of our speakers all have the same thing here. So um, it's not that common for speakers to have that, but I'm pretty glad we, we made that panel um, to be speaking about topics which are not that common, commonly here heard here at the DA. But um, all right, this conference is of course not about me, but of our speakers. So um, yeah, we'll just um, start off with them. Um, we first have uh, David Timmis. Um, he is a um, global communications manager at Generation, one of the largest global employment programs that exist. Um, He's going to prepare uh, people, and especially young people, for the future of work, um, especially with digital skills as they get more and more important. Um, he's educated at the University of Glasgow and the College of Europe, and he was even part of the World Economic Forum. <laughs> so, um, glad to have you here. <laughs> then we have Elena. Um, Elena Aradelian, yes, if I pronounced right. that correctly. Um, She's an international development specialist and social entrepreneur. Um, during daytime, I think, and during nighttime, you're head of tech at the Institute of Global Change, if I understood that correctly. <laughs> um, and you are the head of the Artificial for Development Agency, um, and have worked with numerous other institutions like the World Bank um, in all parts of the world, uh, and even policies for AI and smart cities. And you were educated at the University of Vienna and the Science Po Paris. Um, then we, of course, have uh, Mr. Alberto Sanna. Um, he is um, the director of, for the Center of Advanced Technology in Health and Wellbeing in Milan. Um, he was educated at the Politecnico di Milano in nuclear engineering. Um, he has been working on numerous European research programs and the Horizon 2020 program. Um, and he's interested in edu edutainment video games uh, and an advanced guard photographer. And he'll be speaking about the engineering awareness in socio-technological ecosystems. And finally, last but not least, we have uh, Nicola Schmidt. Um, he is a um, senior researcher and head of the Center for Governance, em for Governance in Emerging Technologies at the Charles University in Prague. If I... <laughs> Institute of International Relations in Prague. Ah, at the Institute of International Relations, I'm sorry, okay. Um, you participated in ESA and NASA funded programs of planetary defense teams. Uh, and um, you have an interest in planetary defense and asteroid mining policies. Uh, and you will be speaking with us today about the planetary scale challenges driven by techno scientific issues and the link to ethical global governance from the current state to possible future cosmopolitan democracy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you told us. <laughs> All right. Now then, um, I hope the, oh well, the presentation is already prepared. So I think I can hand the stage over to David at first. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I was a bit under the weather this morning, but seeing you already gave, gave uh, me a boost in my spirit. So I hope <laughs> I'm going to be able to uh, pull through until the end of the panel. Um, I'm not sure if the presentation is already working. Oh, yes, it is. So uh, th what I bring, I think, to this panel is my expertise, which lies at the intersection between technology, education, and employment. The NGO, uh, the moderator mentioned, generation.org has been founded by McKinsey and Company. And this very short presentation actually has a lot of reference to McKinsey research because of my affiliation with the company. Um, the idea is that what I'm going to present you seems a bit bleak. It doesn't seem very optimistic, but 
knowing that I was going to present first, initially I didn't want to use slides, but I do want to take this opportunity to raise awareness about some topics and about some challenges that we will hopefully discuss in the panel. And my conclusion is positive. There is light, despite the gloominess of some of these fig uh, facts and figures I'm going to show you. This one in particular is not uh, an AI-driven image. It's actually a real image from a warehouse. Uh, such uh, mechanical robots are already taking the jobs of humans around the world. Um, that being said, many of the jobs that they are replacing are jobs which are not very attractive to probably nobody in the room here and to many people around the world. Repetitive jobs, dangerous jobs in many ways, uh, mundane jobs. However, what remains is they are taking jobs. So there's this big question that hopefully we'll be able to discuss in the panel is what happens to the people who are no longer doing the activity that these uh, mechanical uh, robots are doing? To give you a perspective of the reality that is upon us, this is a really recent statistic from Amazon, the, one of the largest uh, online retailers. As you can see, in the future, there's a very high likelihood that the number of robots they quote-unquote hire will equal the number of people they hire. Uh, obviously, uh, Amazon was one of the big tech companies that hired many people during the pandemic to sort of uh, bridge the supply and demand gap they have, and now they're obviously firing people. However, they're not firing the same, you know, robots they've hired as well. So there is a very likely future that, especially in, in warehousing and, and, and online retailing, that more companies like Amazon and Walmart will actually uh, recruit more robots in the ranks than people in the future. What's the situation currently in Europe when it comes to, uh, when it comes to automation and the displacement of jobs due to such technologies? So, in Europe, currently, there are around 200 plus million jobs available and occupied by people. Um, out of them, as you can, if you do the math, it's a simple math here, half of them, so 110 million, are at risk of being disrupted by automation, by technologies that are either robotic, as the mechanical uh, robots you've seen, or by a software. There's actually a, a very um, new uh, technology called robotic process automation, uh, and there's quite a few players now in the industry who offer this, which is a software that basically um, replaces human work that is you know, putting data into an Excel, interpreting that data. So software is also displacing jobs, not just robots. So this is a key trend regarding jobs. And uh, in terms of what jobs are at risk of being displaced by such technologies, we obviously can see it's mostly manual work, uh, repetitive work, face-to-face -face contact you know, that you have in, in, in retail, in accommodation services. COVID has been actually a great way to see what are these jobs most at risk because the people who are being displaced, again, were people who were already at risk of being displaced because of automation. And then COVID showed that, indeed, the face-to-face -face jobs they were having were, were very much at risk. What happens to skills? Because there's always this debate when it comes to automation. You know, it's displacing people from their jobs, but with the right reskilling programs and trainings, you can actually preserve people in the jobs and maybe even give them some more interesting work to do. The demand for reskilling is quite high in Europe and around the world, but these are again uh, figures from, from, from the European Union. The difference that I want to paint with this slide is actually that reskilling and upskilling are very different. The fact that 90 million people need, need upskilling, it's actually um, not, uh, not news and it's not because of automation. Throughout history, people always had to learn on the job. Uh, to give you a concrete example, if you do marketing, it's just about learning a new tool to do your marketing job better. The problem I see are the bigger challenges for the people who will need reskilling, 21 million people. This is a person working in, for instance, a supermarket who maybe in a year or maybe even less will need to become maybe a, a programmer or maybe a nurse to really qualify for a completely new uh, industry or career where there's actually a demand for his or her capabilities. The good news, because there is a bit of good news in the presentation, hopefully more in the, in the discussion we will have, is that in this world of machines and humans, there's no competition in my mind. It's very clear already that the machines are doing better than us, jobs that are repetitive, that imply uh, collecting data, interpreting data. We're not going to be able to compete with them in any way. What makes us, uh, let's say, sustainable as a race, uh, as an employed race in the future, is the fact that we're humans. And I think, the, as much as that sound maybe, uh, sounds a bit naive, the, the fact that we have emotional intelligence, hopefully, many of us here today, the fact that we have empathy, communication skills, collaboration skills, are the sort of soft skills that will be actually still in very high demand in the coming years, together with tech skills. 
And these will be the skills that will differentiate us from, from machines and the skills that will help us keep the jobs we, we so much desire. And maybe just as a closing note before I pass on the, the, uh, pass, pass on the, the virtual mic to the moderator, um, the, the picture I try to paint here is that the challenge of automation and you know, the need of automation is very clear. We, we do need, and companies around Europe and the world have specifically mentioned in a, in a labor shortage, there's a high need to get more software that does the job better than humans and robots that do the jobs better than humans. The question I have for them, since I delivered this presentation to many corporates is, that's fine, get as much automation as you want, but what will you do to reskill the people you might fire because of the same technologies? And many of them already have an answer. Um, I hope by the end of the uh, decade, all of them will have an answer to the reskilling challenge that I see in the coming years. Because it's not an automation challenge, it's a reskilling challenge. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the conversation. Yeah, thank you, David. <laughs> so, um, digital skills are absolutely key for any job in the future. And um, that's actually a nice um, introduction for Elena because she will be speaking about the, how can young people seize the opportunities a, of AI and bring innovation to their communities and possibly their jobs as well, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maximilian. And good morning, everyone. Um, it is a true pleasure to be part of DASICON 2023 and uh, be speaking on this panel. As mentioned before, my name is Elena Ardelen. I'm the co-founder of a nonprofit called Artificial Intelligence for Development Agency. This session is about innovating the globe and how we can use technology to uh, innovate the globe and connect in a connected world. But I think one of the questions I would like to raise is, are we all truly connected today? Are, is everyone benefiting of the opportunities that technology has to offer? Let's take the example of youth, for instance. We know that youth make up around 1.8 million of the world's total population. 94% of youth today are living in developing countries. And if I were to go a little bit farther, we know that 600 million live in um, fragile settings. Now, how many of those have access to the internet, for instance, and can use the internet? In the developed world, around 90% which we are, we are doing pretty well, but in least developed countries, less than 30%. So the digital divide and the lack of opportunities for young people to access technologies, especially emerging technologies like artificial intelligence is true. And I would say that this crude reality is something that really triggered the creation of AIDA, the technology um, nonprofit that I'm running. We really want to give young people an opportunity to be educated in AI, to have access to knowledge and to understand what this technology can do for them. So very early in the creation of the organization, we connected with young people and organizations in Africa and the Middle East to provide trainings, AI awareness and AI knowledge programs to them. We were mind blown to see by the opportunities and the innovations those young people were able to do in their own communities just by being given this opportunity. But this was enough and is not enough for young people in Africa, Middle East, all over the world, and also in Austria and Europe. We know that AI decisions are impacting mostly young people's lives, and yet every day, and yet their power and their influence of those decisions is very limited. And this is something that triggered further research from our side, from the organization side, in really understanding what is, how are youth involved in the design and development of AI solutions? So what we did is that we mapped around 100 and analyzed around 124 AI assessments around the world to understand specifically this. How are they included in AI design and development? You can use this QR code if you are curious to see the AI map and also some of our initial findings of this research. One key finding is that we we need to rethink and reshape the power relationship between young people and AI design and solutions. This is something that we are currently focused on right now and is one of the aspects and one of the challenges I would like to raise and to leave the panel with and the audience is how can we make sure that youth are included in AI solutions, in the design and development of AI solutions. 
We have launched recently a partnership with the Central European University and the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute specifically for this, to understand how um, youth around the world perceive AI, what are their attitudes, and what are their expectations from those technologies in particular. What we know is that they want to have a seat at the decision-making table. They want to be part of the conversation and they want to be actors, change, agents of change, to shape the conversation around AI. We are one organization that is working on this. There are many others that are trying to, to tackle this challenge as well. So we know we are not alone. However, we also know there is much more work that needs to be done and that can be done together. So one of the questions I would like to raise is how we, can we make sure that youth are connected with these technologies and that they are given the right opportunities to innovate? David was mentioning about what these emerging technologies uh, are doing and the way they are impacting and shaping the future of work. My colleagues are gonna talk about other aspects, but yet there are vulnerable groups such as youth that are at risk to be left behind. So together, we can probably rethink the way in which youth interact with those technologies and the word they can say and they, the voices they want to make heard um, in the creation of AI. And this could be the best forum for us to have that discussion. Thank you very much. And I truly look forward to your questions and debate. And with this being said, I will give the mic to the moderator today, Thank you. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> Very interesting and very important topic as well Thank for you. <laughs> the future of technology and the future of developing countries, of course. All right, then, um, Alberto, your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Maximilian. I, first of all, um, when I'm done with my time, stop me. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. difficult <laughs> for me to do so. Okay. Also because I didn't uh, brought slides with me. So um, I, give you, I would like to give you five uh, informations quickly, and let's see if I can make it all five. First, uh, a little bit of background. I am a director of a research center, and uh, uh, this is uh, for the end. Okay, don't look at this, you will look at this uh, later. But uh, um, I'm director of a research center, and I run three research programs. One is uh, the hospital of the future, second is life of the future, and third is city of the future. So we have uh, available in Milan an entire smart city, that has been built around a big a major hospital. So we have all the facilities of an entire city. We have our own private metro, uh, the retail area, the sports facility, the energy is produced on site, hotel, uh, uh, heliport. Uh, whatever you have in a smart city, we have in a small compact environment and we use this as a living lab to import innovation and to make innovation working in real environment and interacting with real people. So first message, the complexity of change and the interdependencies of changes between technology, society, individuals, businesses, there is no rule you can handle without a trial and error approach. So we brought the scientific methodology to an entire gigantic, in a sense, living lab where you have 25,000 people every day interacting with this innovation and all of this. So the first message is, it's too complex to change all the variables we are having now with just bet and assumption. We need to have a trial and error. It's important to have living lab in understanding, adjusting, and when you are done, including the policy level, which is very relevant, because once you understand something, that's the moment in which you should start doing policies, not before end of this. So the first message is this. Second message, we have news, we have very unhealthy and unsustainable lifestyles, <laughs> and is the as individual and society. That's a fact. And uh, we are consuming too much, and this too much consumption is impacting our own individual health, environment, and society. So how can we rebalance the asymmetry of power between, uh, uh, among companies pushing their products into the market 
and possibly even trade agreements that are enabling this approach, and sustainability at the individual societal level. So we came up, the way we design technology is uh, we, g we gave a, a, a naming which is engineering awareness to sustain healthier, greener, and fairer individual and collective behavior. So, what have in our hands as a humanity? You cannot impose behavior to individuals, at least in the Western world or in the Mediterranean culture, okay? What you can do is educate, motivate, provide trustworthy information to the individual and let individual raise awareness and from awareness raise motivation to change. So this is the approach that we design in all possible fields, from automotive, from food and beverage, to small cities, to gaming, uh, to everything, to basically educate th individuals to understand the impact that every single action we have, I'm drinking or not this water, has impact on my health, has impact on the environment, because I have a chain of impact uh, to, uh, uh, to have my water here. Imagine it at the broader level. So, engineering awareness is the methodologies to make individual aware and to leverage on awareness to change. And that's the other part of the... Uh, to create a symmetry of power of consumers doing this through uh, engineering. Third point is... You, 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 you are saying uh, that I, I design video games. Indeed, I design video games in particular, I design edutainment games. What are edutainment games? Is the way in which you can teach to kids this approach, not only to adults. We are so, let's say, uh, confused, uh, and that's difficult to leverage on us. But I give you an example. We designed edutainment platform, gaming platform, to educate kids to eat more fruits and vegetables, to understand seasonality of the food, to understand the impact in terms of uh, your own well-being environment in eating fruit and vegetables. We did it in the science way, so we tested this in four classrooms, to, uh, 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 and we achieved, to make it simple and short, 26% increase of vegetable intake by kids that played our game. And those kids are changing not only their own, their own uh, let's say, behavior, they are changing the family behavior, they are changing the, fr the friend's behavior. So it's extremely important to invest in edutainment on kids. They are the only innovators. Youngers, like Maximilian, are too late, okay? We need to, have to get them <laughs> even younger. And there is no more power than kids between, that's, uh, that's our target, 6 to 13. Because before 6, they are not yet in gray, in, uh, able to do so. After, they have already, let's say, developed a, a, an antagonist uh, uh, activity against uh, the world. They have to invent themselves, not to uh, understand. First, a last sentence, and a last point is, uh, <coughs> is uh, art and culture. We have started a very big and, I would say, very successful, uh, successful program to put together neuroscience, visual arts, metaverse, artificial intelligence, non-fungible token, NFT, and we are using art, visual art in particular, to aggregate and create empathy among people to leverage on the capacity of individuals through empathy to reach consensus. In, instead, of to, instead of confronting on, uh, on imposing our own vision. And we have fo been focusing on photography, because photography is by definition objective. We show how differently we see uh, from a, 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 a hypothetical objective photography, what, how different is what we all see. And then we, we, we observe that people is interested and getting curious of why do you see this? Instead, 
if you are in a different uh, approach, is you are not seeing what I see. You are wrong, I'm, I'm good. So it seems to be a very simple uh, approach, but has a, long, a, a big impact in terms of team building, and team building on a broader scale means cultural, uh, let's say, uh, cultural uh, inter, 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 inter exchange. So this is the, the last message that I want to give you, that uh, we are leveraging on art and culture to create this sort of uh, uh, interest, curiosity, and empathy between individuals to create, to make, to leverage and make uh, uh, more evident what makes us uh, uh, similar rather than what makes us different. And uh, just last sentence, it's incredible as uh, we don't uh, uh, feel something which is obvious. 70% of our brain is elaborating images. And our culture is created through how we read images. So different cultures see different things. And we need to have, give evidence to this. Even in the same culture, you see different things. But think how a, a symbol is seen in different countries in the world. The only way to leverage on this value, which is how many different things are seen by the single sign, the single symbol, is creating a moment of interaction and discussion. Thank you. And this is, uh, on, on Monday, I will give uh, a much broader talk uh, in this university here in Vienna, okay? So it's Webster University. So if you are interested to, to, having, to seeing slides, okay, <laughs> you can also come there. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. All right, so last but not least, um, Nicola. <laughs> there is no really, not a really introduction and transition from your topic. I mean, maybe kind of awareness and that people are not aware that there is space and that space needs policy as well. Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, I see that uh, talking about planetary defense, cosmopolitan democracy and the fate of our planet is going to be a daunting task, but I will <laughs> do my best, you know, to fit in seven minutes. <laughs> uh, so I'll divide my talk... Uh, into, let's say, the description of planetary defense is about, uh, and then I will talk about more uh, the societal and political scientific perspective and some possible governance models and why I decided to study it. So what, what is planetary defense? You know, there's a, there a community of astronomers uh, which uh, began about 300 years ago <laughs> observing as asteroids, uh, and uh, about 30 years ago, they truly con uh, like confirmed uh, that the, the dinosaurs were extinct because of the fall, fall uh, because of the hit of an asteroid to the Mexican Bay, the Chiclix Club asteroid, which was about 10 kilometers wide. And uh, especially the U.S. government uh, decided that they are interested uh, into knowing to what extent there are possibly other asteroids which can wipe out uh, the humanity. So I'm optimist because we know there is nothing like that going to happen in our lifetime and it's, and it's not going to happen in the coming several decades, maybe even 100 years, because uh, the astronomers uh, have observed uh, literally 99% of uh, the solar system when it comes to the asteroids bigger than one kilometer. We have knowledge about, uh, let's say, 50% of uh, asteroids which are bigger than half kilometer and uh, we have about 20% knowledge about uh, the asteroids which are bigger than 50 meters. So we can be scared about what the astronomers like to call city killers, and that's where you know, the political science is coming in. Uh, the astronomers and then uh, the group of engineers now who are developing missions to deflect these asteroids which are not falling from sky, but they are circling uh, sun, and time to time their <coughs> orbits can uh, intersect with the orbit of Earth so they can hit uh, each other. Uh, they, they are, of course, really keen to save the planet uh, from the asteroids, but the fact is that, uh, uh, that no, nothing serious uh, is, going, uh, no, is going to happen in the, in the coming decades. These small asteroids are a problem, that's, that's for sure. So you, we, have an astronomers, we have astronomers who are observing the planet, and we have engineers who are developing uh, the deflection methods. There are two missions, DART, which is already in space by NASA. Uh, DART hit uh, the asteroid a couple of months ago. It was a small moon around uh, a bigger asteroid, and it was an absolute historical success that we already know that we have means how to deflect these asteroids. 
Then there is an, another mission, HERA, which is uh, developed by, by European Space Agency. And this mission uh, is going to go to this asteroid to measure the consequences from the impact. So we are going to have a knowledge not only about the measures and how we can deflect the asteroids, but also about the consequences of that hit them, because asteroids are not necessarily only rocks and piece of irons. They are mostly so-called rubber piles. About 80% of them are rubber piles. So it's really complicated to hit something what is just a rubber pile created by millions of years of a small gravity. So you cannot just take it out you know, because you spread it across uh, the environment. So from my perspective as a political scientist, I see a really great epistemic community of uh, epistemic communities as, as a group of people who share the same knowledge and the same interest in some scientific inquiry. Uh, who are observing, uh, observing asteroids, who are observing our solar system, and who are designing means how to deflect it. This community have been working uh, for the last 20 years or 30 years uh, even about the governance models. And they were proposing in the United Nations uh, several new groups uh, to, to discuss uh, the planetary defense issues on the international level. And they were successful in deploying uh, the International Asteroid Warning Network, which is like an international cooperative body for uh, sharing the knowledge about the asteroids and the orbital paths and uh, about uh, the characteristics of the asteroid, etc. And on the other hand, we have, uh, uh, we were successful, this community was successful in designing so-called same page space mission planning advisory group. They are going to meet soon in, here in Vienna because uh, there is going to be planetary defense conference here in Vienna within a month. Uh, uh, where I'm going to present some ideas, which I will to tell you in the coming minutes. And, um, uh, but they were not successful in uh, establishing so-called uh, mission authorization and oversight group. These experts simply thought that there is a possibility that uh, the experts will oversight and authorize uh, these particular missions. But understandably, the representative of states were not so happy about the idea that experts will be de de uh, deciding over the fate of the planet. But at the same time, we live in the international system where you know, the common sense of uh, the international relations is the anarchy. So the end is that uh, we let it uh, for the Security Council to decide if something uh, is detected on the collision course of Earth. So we are living in an age where we know about the asteroids, we have the means about the deflection methods, but we don't have means how to make a proper decision about it. So if you saw the movie Don't Look Up, yes, it's exactly what's going to happen very soon if, or not soon, sorry, I'm not you know, predicting. <laughs> it's going to happen if something is detected on the collision course. <laughs> Moreover, what I think is um, uh, not, a, not a great, um, uh, let's say mood within the community is that there are people who who feel this messianic uh, uh, perception of their role as scientists uh, to save the planet uh, from uh, from these dinosaur killers, uh, you know, making these names of city killers, etc. So and uh, trying, you know, to make awareness about this threat. And now the political science comes in. In critical security studies, now we divide or distinguish between uh, two main branches of uh, schools how to study security. The first one is uh, the Busan's uh, uh, Copenhagen School, uh, which is studying uh, threats or say security from the perspective, uh, how we can develop policy without the threats, with the absence of threats. Uh. So they are also studying uh, how we are securitizing some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, dynamics or something around us. Uh. So planetary defenders are apparently securitizing asteroids as city killers and trying to search for uh, an achievement or say the desirable end in, in the absence of threats, so how we deflect the asteroids, how we engineer our future, how can we avoid this catastrophe. But on the other hand, they are still working on this technology, and the technology is going to be owned by nations and by states, by, by, by states which are living in, an, in anarchy. On the other hand, the second school, which I mostly follow and I contribute to as a political scientist, is a Welsh school of uh, critical security studies, and they perceive security from a different perspective. How can we create an environment which enables people to flourish, to develop uh, a well-being, which is not about the absence of threat, it's not about defining the threat, it's about defining the conditions and implementing policies now which will enable people to flourish. And that's uh, where my interest came into the planetary defense, because I don't think that planetary defense is about to the necessity to have technologies to deflect uh, asteroids and save the planet uh, from these city killers, if I, use, if I can use this language. But I think it's much more about the opportunity of humankind to develop policies and international or maybe planetary governance systems uh, around which they will be able or we will be able 
and to make proper decisions so, so the technologies will not be threatening us, but the technologies will be simply inherently part of that global policy. We don't have international institutions. We talk about international all the time. We don't take talk about planetary governance. We don't talk about cosmopolitan governance. <coughs> if you start talking about cosmopolitan democracy, you will be immediately uh, labeled as, as a radical political scientist because it's simply not possible to have a global parliament. And yet we have a European parliament. About 100 years ago, there was no idea that we would uh, have, a ho uh, have a European parliament making decisions uh, over regulations which will be later imposed uh, or let's say, yeah, imposed uh, on, the, on, on the national governments of the member states uh, of the European Union. And there's a really interesting article written by Alexander Wendt, uh, which is about why the world state is inevitable. And he approached uh, this idea from the teleological perspective, which means and says, Alexander Wendt is a really well recognized, one of the most influential political scientists in, in our age. And he said that uh, when the states are living in, um, uh, in the state of anarchy, so it's, uh, it will be actually the states who will be willing to achieve uh, a model of uh, cooperation which will actually let, lead us uh, to the world state. Because previously, let's say 2,500 years ago, we were living in an environment of city-states. Then we were uh, living in an environment of empires. We are living in an environment of states for about 150 years. It's not a long period of uh, humankind uh, when we developed these states. After the Second World War, we actually developed these environment of 190 states. So there is no reason that we couldn't reach in 50, 100, 200 years another model of uh, global governance which will be more integrated than the current one. And planetary defense, from my perspective, is a really great opportunity how humanity can simply sit around our table and say, okay, so we have this knowledge. And this knowledge, actually, the, which was produced by the scientist, is um, imposing uh, new responsibilities, new political responsibilities on political authorities because it's us who are providing them through democracy the legitimacy to, to govern. And if they are not capable to govern uh, in an age where we have a different knowledge, they will be losing uh, their political legitimacy from, say, the principle of democratic theory. So in that way of understanding, when you have on one side the science of planetary defense, the, the technology of planetary defense, and on the other side this teleological argument of Alexander Wendt and all this dynamics around it, it uh, it's, I think that's the optimistic way. Climate change is not about we are going to end in a climate catastrophe. It's a great opportunity that we simply understand now what's happening on the planetary scale. 50 years ago, we wouldn't be willing to talk about it. And now we talk about it. And this is the teleological dynamics which Alexander Wendt is, uh, is talking about. We simply go forward to the way that we are going to govern the planet from non-international but more cosmopolitan way and hopefully one day maybe in, in a democratic way. So, thank you. Yeah. All right, so um, first of all, thank you for all of you being here and having such interesting topic to us, uh, for us to share with. Um, well, um, we've reached the end of the presentations of the speakers, so there will be now a question and answer session and some kind of open discussion until the time runs out, which is unfortunately pretty soon, I guess. So <laughs> please, are there any, any questions from, from the audience? My name is Anubhav. I am a second year my student from the academy. My question is directed generally at the panel, but it's specifically from Professor Sana's position on engineering awareness. My <coughs> sort of what I was building up to is that it's probably a normative system that has value to everyone in the panel and generally to society. In an ideal world, we can have paradigms where all replaced jobs are taken over by people who get the skill set to take over them because of like collective awareness and that helps with collective security or participation. But my question really is, is the incentive of the actors who participate in innovation really to provide this awareness? Because private corporations seeking profits or even states that sort of develop pioneering technology for security purposes or to collect information or intelligence. Do they really have an in interest in providing either epistemic certainty to people or transparency to public actors? And does that sort of work collectively towards something? Or do you believe that even if we believe that's a value, it's not something that really happens in the field? It's a very good point because exactly the disruption of the engineering awareness model is exactly this, is to put in line and create a, a, a value-based system in which you have a shared interest in providing this. Because at the end, the company, they want to make profit. 
they don't care if they make profit in the right way or in the wrong way. But if you realign the system, and actually the engineering awareness is a, a way to conceive economy, because it's a, a awareness-based economy. So where you trade awareness, and the, basically you perceive the value of assets, which are not the financial value. We have done this in, in our small city, in the retail area, and people pro give more money to things that give them back more value in the very moment they understand it. And companies were very happy to have loyalty and higher margins for lower products, for, 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 for a smaller amount of products, and having co-production and co-design of new product with the consumer. So actually, it, this is a, exactly a disruption of the business model, and that's why it may work if uh, our work, our, our, my work is to try to show it, not to make the change happen because it's too big. But this is uh, the, the vision of a researcher. All right. Does that answer your question? <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah, perfect. Uh, um, my question is for everybody, but especially Alberto. And thank you all very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, about your work uh, with games, I wanted to ask uh, you and everybody else for, for that matter, um, will this kind of work apply in the metaverse? And what do you think about the metaverse? Is it something that's it's not here yet? Is it coming? Is it still born? Is it bullshit? What's your, what's your opinion? Thanks. So I, I reply that I leave the, the opinion of the metaverse to everybody. I'm already working on this and in this. My art project is a physical art project, and is a digital art project, and there is a metaverse area. In fact, I believe that technology is a possibility. The only way to understand how to make it uh, valuable is use it and having people tested. We have been presented, presented in... Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, for example, uh, I just came from Cannes, where we presented our metaverse applied to art in the World Artificial Intelligence Cannes Forum. So one of the largest events of artificial intelligence, and people were entering into the metaverse, not discussing metaverse or listening to companies trying to sell metaverse to whatever. And uh, actually, I think, from a, a, a policy perspective, metaverse is a new state. It's, an, it's something that uh, goes beyond every possible boundaries because you can jump in and have enforcement policies because digital gives you the chance to enforce policies okay, in the metaverse. And my, my focus on this is from neuroscience perspective because we want to understand how the brain interacts because this is exactly, in a sense, uh, the challenge. Uh, I, I want you to reveal a secret. We are all brains and we interact with everything outside of us through our cognitive process, which are emotions, which are uh, cognitive processes, and that's why we reverse engineer technology from brains on, which is the opposite, I would like to say, of neuromarketing. Neuromarketing is a way to exploit weaknesses of our brain to make us react in a way that has been designed by others. The engineering awareness approach at the neuroscience level is exactly provide you awareness, and thanks to this awareness, you, are, you feel your uh, enforcement in, in your behavior. So that's uh, the metaverse for me, it's uh, a space to be conquered. Can I add something here to be, because we are here in a debate, and I do agree metaverse is exciting, but, and I don't think it's bullshit to, <laughs> to quote the phrase you use, but I think it's hyped, and let's just be honest. I worked for Google for five, four years, I think, I, we didn't mention that in my bio, so I do understand, exactly as you mentioned, tech companies like Meta, who even rebranded themselves to present this as the new thing. To be honest, actually, now as we speak, the closest uh, iteration of the metaverse in the way that it was described, including by meta, is actually Roblox, a game for under 18-year-olds. Which, speaking of gamification, and your question also touched upon this topic, if you want to influence in a positive way the mind of uh, the young generations coming uh, you know, ahead, the new generations, 
work with Roblox because they already have a, some sort of a metaverse land in which they already have hundreds of millions of children playing every day. Use what's existing and don't, you know, think about uh, what, what, again, Meta, I keep going back to them, what they promise, because that will take quite a few years to, to come to fruition. And as a last point, just to give you an example, because we did speak about AI in the panel as well, AI has also been through such a phase, if you look about three or four or five years ago, all the startups in Silicon Valley just added AI at the end and they became hugely valuable. Probably 80 or 90% of them are no longer existing as companies. The metaverse is going for exactly the same sort of a hot spring, you know, hot summer break in which everybody's like metaverse this, metaverse that. Actually, the technology is serious. It's incredibly powerful, but we're, I think, hyping it a bit too much for what it currently is. What it can be, I also believe it can be quite disruptive. I would uh, really act a bit more cautious and say, let's see what we currently have. Let's see how, how we can make maybe games like Roblox better so that the next generation will have maybe even a better solution for metaverse. So that's my, just to calm a bit the uh, metaverse spirits, because I personally think it's, it's, uh, we're a bit ahead of ourselves yet. That's why I'm working now on this. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise it's too late. <laughs> All right, so um, to come back to your um, control instead of manipulation uh, topic, um, would that be something that would apply to space as well, like take active control instead of being manipulated by whoever goes there first? Taking control of what? Of the space and of um, the orbit in, in, in a way. <laughs> 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 well, that's a really imperialist perspective, <laughs> taking control of uh, orbit. Yeah. The Too people taking <laughs> control of the space themselves and not letting kind of large companies or single countries have the most resources conquer it and then just... Yeah, okay, so let's it. move to um, <laughs> uh, resource mining in space now. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's another topic now which uh, I was studying last year. Uh, there is an interesting dynamics, by the way, when it comes to space resources and that's... Uh, for example, Luxembourg, they invest really massively into space mining technologies and space mining startups. Uh, Luxembourg might look like, like a really small country, but uh, they are making a huge revenues uh, from their SAS uh, satellite company, which is actually one of the biggest communication uh, network uh, in, uh, in orbit. So they know what they are doing, uh, but the point is that uh, if a state, like an independent state, uh, decides to, to go into space mining uh, and interpret international law in a certain way, it, it of course space uh, uh, paves the road uh, towards, uh, uh, let's say, more uh, private uh, entities uh, to, uh, to operate there. Because when, when a private entity operates uh, in space, it somehow answers uh, to the particular state who allow it uh, to launch something into space because it's states uh, who are responsible to other states according to international law. And uh, when it comes to space planning, there's an international dynamic, uh, interesting, interesting dynamic that uh, no huge mining companies are going to space. Because you know, they are rich enough to build anything they want on moon, definitely like, like that. You know? But they are not doing that because the startups you know, are trying to develop small technologies doing some uh, small uh, breakthroughs, you know, investing not too much, you know, and invest themselves you know, into such missions. You know. And uh, one day, and I think that's, in, that's going to be the breakthrough day, when a big company like ExxonMobil decides that it makes sense to go to space and mine something on the moon, we will change like, you know, everything. You know, because uh, especially the economy in space will be completely different. Because if you can mine, for, a, for example, water on the moon and support the water, um, back to the Earth orbit, you know, then the water might be like 50 times less expensive than the water you bring from, uh, from Earth. You know, I don't know now the, the figure, but it's like 40, 50 times, if I'm not mistaken. And there is, of course, the, this Artemis Accords and Artemis mission. Americans are willing to build a permanent base on Moon, and they are gathering states around the world you know, to participate in you know, mostly democratic states. China is willing to build their own, uh, uh, their own uh, permanent base. And with permanent uh, presence on moon, we will have to mine resources. And that's going to be a tipping point because mining resources is simply no consensus in the United Nations who owns uh, the mined uh, uh, resources. Because the space, international space law is written in a really cosmopolitan way. And the reason why it is probably is because when they were writing it, there was a you know, this um, fight between, not fight, like uh, this competition between the uh, Soviet Union and United States, uh, and they didn't think that other 
actors will simply step in. So mining in space, that's going to be, I think, you know, uh, economic revolution in orbit, like immediately. Uh, but it will take some time. <laughs> Not necessarily, because of this permanent base uh, of United States uh, on the moon. This is going to happen in this decade. You know? All right, so future jobs are going to lie in the space as well. <laughs> yeah, interesting topic, actually. And a topic not many people have thought about, I would say. Um, right. Um, are there any other questions? Did I miss someone? Otherwise, we could just... There's, um, a, there's a question. Oh, there's, one here. Yeah, there's questions here, here, Two. and then if I may, I would have one. My question is to Mr. Timis. You have mentioned that the trends and effects of uh, robotic tech pushing manual labor workers out of the jobs. However, my question is kind of from the other side. Apart from the rise of robotic in big corporations, uh, is it also becoming more accessible in general to like small business owners, let's say? Will we soon see, uh, or maybe we can already see, uh, robots being employees in small businesses so a robot barista around the corner here in Vienna or something like that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And the short answer is not yet, but it's usually the bigger companies that give the trends. And I think we're at the really important inflection point even within these big companies themselves because until recently the cost of paying for such a robot was still too much higher than actually hiring people but we're at an inflection point, meaning that actually now the cost of buying and, and maintaining such robot is probably on par with what it would entail to hire and onboard and train the person. The next level, the next phase is for the cost of that maintenance and, and support of the robot being so much cheaper that indeed for such jobs as I've shown, there's just no need for the human workers, which, which then will make the robots themselves more accessible to small companies as well. So there is indeed such a possibility for a barista to be a, a robotic hand and uh, as much as maybe some of us would not like that, it will make sense from a business and cost perspective in the next 10, 15 years, maybe even sooner, I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure, maybe like general question, like uh, David, your presentation, maybe it's too optimistic. Taking only about the talking only about the robotics and the replacement job with a hard and dangerous work. Speaking of artificial intelligence, we know that, uh, for example, uh, artificial intelligence is much faster to work with information. And given the development of uh, technology, will there be a risk uh, for many people, for many more professions, especially intellectual and uh, possible even scientific fields? What do you think? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not, maybe Elena, would you like to answer this question as well? I, I do have a short answer, is that yes, we're at the phase that uh, now with ChatGPT and such technologies, we finally see jobs that would maybe five or ten years ago never would have imagined that they'll be replaced. Uh, legal um, assistants, interns, that job is already being replaced as we speak because ChatGPT does the job of going through a lot of files faster than an intern, than a human can do. Uh, content creators, people writing short content based on news, already uh, ChatGPT and similar technologies are doing it better. So yes, we're in the phase in which technology is replacing such jobs. But since you did mention the need for more optimism, maybe, Elena, if you'd like to, to shed some light on that, to pass a bit, the, since it's your topic as well. So thank you for the question. Yeah, th thank you as well for the question. Thanks, um, David. Um, absolutely. So there is definitely a shift in the way we approach work and in the way we, we think and, and, and see AI in general, interact with AI. Um, however, we statistics show and research shows that also more jobs will be created. So there are changes to the way in which we work today. Some jobs may disappear. If we take the accountings, for instance, um, in the 80s, you had a few accountants that would do their own calculations. With the introduction of the Excel, um, we you know, reduced dramatically and drastically the number of accountants, so you have one person who can deal of, who can do, who does that. Uh, and what it means is that AI, for instance, for us today, it's going to create new jobs and it's also going to augment, and I'm picking up on your idea here, uh, augment our capacities as humans to do certain activities. So we'll, thanks to ChatGPT, we'll be able to go through a huge number of files much faster. 
so that we can probably be um, able to focus then on really what is essential and the structuring and and um, you know the cognitive skills that are then uh, then needed. So there are shifts. There are some jobs that are gonna disappear, but we. I, I do have an optimistic view on this, saying that there are other jobs that will be created and the technology is uh, something, is a tool for human beings and it's a tool that is going to be able to augment our capacities and our capabilities. However, it's still very much important to start talking about this today and to bring this knowledge down to everybody as soon as possible, including youth who are in the process of acquiring new skills and preparing themselves for the future of work. You Maybe want to add something? Ju just to add something, because I remember an in incredible example. So if I have just one minute for this, sorry for going a bit over time. But maybe some of you have heard of this company called DeepMind, which was acquired by Google mm -hmm. some years ago, which for me is the most valuable uh, group of people in the world currently, maybe even more than OpenAI that has been so much talked about. And the people at DeepMind in 2016 developed a technology, uh, which a t type of AI, uh, AlphaFold, I think, which beat the top player in the world at Go this ancient uh, chess-like game from Asia, which, you know, in the past, no other machine has beaten any human player. In this case, the AI beat the, the top player in history five times out of five games. Recently, um, an, another actually amateur player in Go defeated the same AlphaGo technology that defeated the best champion in the world by using another AI to help him, the human, play better. And I think for me, that was the summary of what the future hopefully will look like. AI helping humans, in some cases, even defeat the same technologies they created. And if we do go back now, if you go a bit with sci-fi, with, with the Terminator metaphor, in which, again, machines and humans collaborating were the, were the ones that won at the end of the day. And I think the future, hopefully with less dramatic consequences, would be the same. All there right. is a point on that, uh, that the defeated AI now has the capacity because it has, has learned how to control a flaw that he has. So now, unfortunately, the yeah. AI, the, the competition between AI make AI even, better. even much better. And using uh, a low-level player, uh, the million tests that an AI did to understand which, which was the flaw of the other is exactly scaring because basically human is creating entities that are beating each other to getting better. And human is just doing this. Yeah. That's, there is also the, the bad part of, of, each true, of this story, true. which is the next step. <laughs> if I may. All right, then. I mean, I'm afraid we have <laughs> run out of time now. So it would have been an interesting discussion to continue with, but we may continue that in the, in the lunch break right now, which is going to take place from now to um, quarter past one, I think. And we will be seeing again each other here in Festsaal um, for the public uh, health breakout session of the next panel. Um, I thank you all, my participants, for coming here to Vienna. We are very honored to have you. And thank you all for your valuable input. And, uh, and thank you for moderating input. such a panel. I mean, <laughs> given the topics. <laughs> thank you. Cheers to you. <laughs>